Welcome to the Jane Pope Gesge Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. I'm Erin Willis and I'm curator of this collection. The Heritage Room is a unique part of the Lincoln City Libraries. We are a non-tax supported collection. We're supported by an endowment from the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. And the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association also supports this, uh, this collection through their membership, their programming, and their fundraising efforts. So we'd like to thank the NLHA for their continued support of the Heritage Room and for establishing that original endowment that pays for programs like this and that um, maintains the collection. One of the most important functions of the Heritage Room is to preserve and promote literature by and about Nebraska authors. We do that by collecting and maintaining vertical files on our more than 4,000 Nebraska authors represented in this collection. The Heritage Room now holds more than 14,000 volumes, which is only a representative selection of the body of work produced by Nebraska authors. We also have author information files, manuscripts, memorabilia, and as you can see, we have artwork. Um, we have Lauren, uh, Lauren Isley's dollhouse over here. We have various things donated by authors and by their uh, foundations. Preserving the works and ephemera of Nebraska authors is only one of the functions of the Heritage Room. We also celebrate authors by providing a forum for authors to share their books and for allowing the community to learn about the great literary talent in our state. So the John H. Ames Reading Series, which is what we're at right now, has been providing this forum for the past 31 years. Our recent Ames Readings are available on Five City TV and those can be viewed on the Five City TV's Video On Demand site. For our video on demand viewers, I would like to thank you for tuning in and to invite you to visit the Heritage Room. We are on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library, 136 South 14th Street in Lincoln, Nebraska. Our public service hours are Tuesday through Friday, noon to 3 p.m. and Sundays 2 to 5 p.m. We are currently in the Heritage Room during our Sunday afternoon public service hours and this is the 212th Ames Reading Series. Langham's poems appear in a variety of journals, including the Kenyon, Gettysburg, Chicago, Colorado, North American, Notre Dame, and Southern Humanities Reviews, as well as Fence, Verse, Jacket, Slope, Pool, and Diagram. He teaches at the University of Nebraska Omaha MFA in Writing Program, and he's founder and director of the Seven Doctors Pro Project, a Nebraska Writers Collective Program. And we're thrilled to have Steve with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Grateful to be here. <clears throat> Grateful to be back, as a matter of fact. I was uh, here in 2002, uh, not long after my book, Freezing, uh, which came out from New Issues Press and Western Michigan University, was, was released. And it was uh, nostalgic then. Uh, in, in a similar memory, uh, I have a similar memory, uh, and, and that is holding that uh, uh, book as a youngster, that book uh, On Common Ground. It was a book written about the, uh, included the work of four of our uh, notable Nebraska authors, all four of whom are, are, are so important to me, uh, directly and indirectly, and they are uh, the three Ks and Don Welch, uh, Ted Kuzer and Greg Kuzma, Bill Clefcorn, who you mentioned, and, and Don Welch, who helped pave the way for so many of us extraordinary writers and human beings. I'm going to read from <coughs> this uh, collection, What It Looks Like, How It Flies, and some newer poems, too. The first poem in the book is called Assembly. As carefully, let's say, as mouthing a hymn to deaf children, this is how we assemble for the day. A polychromic sunrise, to be sure, but not for the sun, old one head, one face, for you and your stereo mind. Or ask Miss Wonderment dressed in maize, poppy seeds in her hair, polishing the metals, oiling the woods, whistling our anthem. Repeat after me, over the traffic's inconsequentiality, the second and third verses from the beginning. Ding dong. That's the church bell shattering the wind. She prayed to her God and he prayed to his. It's half past. The wounded recorder overwhelms 
commonplace birds content to circle the churches on church row. Enter, enter, and take some time to examine the altar, to walk the maze of reflection, and bow to the military birds and our seal of plenty. The Midwest. I remember this old guy at the bar where I worked gestured toward a girl seated with friends at a round table and said, you really need to learn to pause, study the small of a woman's back, the parallel lines curving upward. Are her shoulders little shouts or whispers and her neck slightly untuned? Does it plead to know how best to begin to pursue her. But I was mainly interested in scoring then, in showing you how many bottles I could hold aloft in the dim light, and getting and staying loaded for days at a time. It's rude to talk too much about yourself. That's what we learn here in the Midwest. Days are numbered. We ask you to contribute to the bottom line to catch each other in your sullen reproaches, crashing swoons, make it look easy these next squalid hours. Some little nitpickers claim we're improving, but we can't all be angels of mercy or pain, hunting and gathering, failing and building, saving nothing for later, sleeping it all off. Economics. I was that kid in school who never said a word, and I despised those fakes. Even swiping their lunch money made me glad. You'd think I'd be over it by now. It's a durable enterprise. Memory, I mean. I've said this before, but I'll scream it again. It makes no difference whose socks they are. All that matters in this house is your feet are warm, your little tootsies. Anyone who doesn't think economics rules the day will be remembered as a rube, not a rascal or a vixen. So go out and earn, and when you have, don't forget how happy we all were around the fire while father strummed and sang. <clears throat> the Originals. His trying all of a sudden so hard to clearly mimic the lofty new originals as a way to demonstrate he was truly paying attention to the culture the last 30 years made our little group wince. I winced. And I haven't winced, really eyes and teeth winced, in a decade. I think I blushed. I know I sighed. I paced frantically, and I looked out the kitchen window, though I couldn't tell you the first thing I saw out there. I hollered at Eileen. Eileen, I hollered, come out here and look at this bullshit. But she was at work, at the hospital. She's always liked kids, even sick ones. She knows how to talk to them. Eileen doesn't need to stick to the text like I do. The little onesie twosie questions such as school, which, subject, favorite, she knows how to listen, too. Thank God I have Eileen in my life. But I need her now. Or someone who understands. You don't just wake up one morning, walk outside to grab the paper, and get shot in the head. Only those who commit entirely to the life die in the sudden gunfire they wait their whole lives for. And even when we realize the love-hate on our knuckles never varnishes off, even when we've almost forgotten the name of the cause we are going out to fight for, even if they slaughter our babies and cut off their earlobes as a symbol, we never turn or run away. 
Anything else, I tell Eileen, is child's play. A box of ornaments. We placed the box of ornaments in the corner, out of the way, and we started to heap the other boxes on top of the box of ornaments. I understand this is common in the suburbs. One day we caught a disease. It was fatal. Reluctantly, we attended the support group. It is where we learned to say we with little irony. We are going to die, for instance, we said. And let's meet later at Red Lobster, which we learned to say Red Lobster, thinking of the weight of the enormous plastic menu with no detectable irony. Sustenance is our evolution in an affront, one of us blurted out. And no one at Red Lobster judged him for it. We had our own booth, generally only four of us could sit comfortably, but we were pretty thin. We turned different shades, including gray and yellow. Most of us had terrific memories, even for details. We could hardly believe how expendable we were. No one said this directly. We were emotional only so much as the situation allowed. The waitress is beautiful, for instance, and... The waitress's child has leukemia. Describing our symptoms was poetic, symphonic. Some of us were in remission, and others, well, their refusal to update us on their condition became a sore subject. We had to ask their spouses and lovers and older sisters on the sly, and sometimes even they couldn't tell us, which we marked as a kind of bravery for which we all shared obvious envy. <clears throat> I'm going to read one more from this uh, collection and then a few uh, newer poems. <clears throat> the Northeast. <clears throat> Poetry is dead. That's why we adore it. I saluted the mercenaries as they approached the chamber. The shamans attended the symposium. Wastrels pulled weeds in grandmother's garden. Just another day in the northeast. The wind settled, then blew. We all talked on our phones and assembled in circles on the road. Seven or eight of us then went to the bar. I meant to order the drink with the funny name and one for the uncle of the bride but decided instead to take a walk. These places and actions, the bar, a walk, make me think of other bars and walks. Made monumental, we strolled into a blast of headwind, the siren in her stoop, the bell in the east, ring, ring, our endless conversation. Later, we go for a ride in the boat and the fog comes in. And now we're navigating via compass, like the time before, and the time before that. <clears throat> I, uh, been writing a <clears throat> bunch of poems, and and then, and I think our work is is or can be more collaborative than we often think it is, right? Uh, so I had this bunch of poems, and I finally got around to printing them all out, which took me a while. Then I handed them over to a friend, and he came back with a possible order for a new manuscript, which was a delight and very kind of him. And I, I wasn't sure about this poem that he's seeing as the title poem of this manuscript. But he was, so maybe I'll read it to you and see what you think. Uh, it's called The Man Who Knows Himself. We found him, 
the man who knows himself and what he wants, lying in the shade of the palm trees in the hammock, and we followed him, first with the compact binoculars we brought to look at the birds. When I saw some and tried to focus, they moved, and when I tried again, they flew away. And then each day as he made the rounds, breakfast, then a stroll on the hotel grounds, then to the pool, two towels and a daiquiri. Sometimes his lady would join him, elegant, tan, soft-spoken, we could barely hear her, and sometimes he arrived alone. My wife desired him openly. I know that look. Depositing all the accumulated shame in me, regret in us, on him, on them. When you get to our age, it's even more important, fantasy. So is restraint. So for a week or so after the trip, we called him the man who knows who he is and what he wants out of life. And we laughed, clicking at the TV. Though how were we, accustomed as we are to this house, these cabinets, this food, our dirty dishes, to ever really know or say or even venture a guess. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> so welcome. Come on in. It's not part of the poem. It's hey, welcome. Come on in. <laughs> well, you never know with, with contemporary poetry, do you? <clears throat> This is called Sonnet. I'm, I'm pretty liberal about what we may call the sonnet, much to the irritation of some others, but so it goes. It is 14 lines, this thing I'm calling sonnet, but the rest of it doesn't cohere with the form as it's been established. But that is part of our work, isn't it? Breaking those forms, making new ones. Sonnet. <clears throat> oh. Mortality, what a bust. These little lies we tell ourselves. I told you the red and yellow wires are crossed. I'm proof rock and Levi's. I'm a little lost. Everyone says, just say it, get it out. The filaments and cantilevers won't burst. So I devoted many hours to talking to myself. I talked about the kind of trouble the wise won't touch. What would you do if you were someone else? I put the red wine aside. I sucked in my gut. Then I stared into the encyclopedia. What a rut. I fashioned a knife, then a gun, then a protractor from bars of soap. When I was told my art is opaque and lifelike, I stopped. <clears throat> this poem is uh, a little associative and includes a, a moment, and I think I reference it directly uh, that I had with a, after a reading with a former teacher. And it, it, it ends at one of my favorite, it, it ends in the last moment of one of my favorite books of all time. That's uh, Candide's Voltaire. And the poem is called Dactyls and Trochies. It is in the finding such as iron ore, a spectacular search as if for buried miners. All these broken bandits and grim hustlers, clackety clack, the universe, the town. Specialties of the house, Roquefort, Abyssinians, Dactyls and Trochies, the moon's in our sights, there above the transom. And your boy has fine motor skills. He throws strikes. Increasing lack of appreciation for rogues and outlaws, war-loving extras, beautiful, dangerous people, light applause for censorship, for salaciousness, their divine aura, however misplaced, 
motivates us. Always on planes, sometimes on boats, other conveyances, a sigh from the compartment of the train, something shiny in the dark late last night. Let's go out and find it. Then when Mike got a job, I thought, I better get one. The pain started from there, capsized on our filthy boat in the fog with a bell buoy, can you hear it, nearby. Give my love to Miranda, Susan, Cheryl. Effusions, godlike, singular, tempting. Some temptresses we know inspire a form of triage. The antivirals baffle the chronic sufferers. We kept willfully making a story of a story, a little cartoon with distinctive patches of curly hair on the round heads of the happy characters, or just leaning to my friend's ear to whisper. It was a tough day. I brought my instruction manual. I walked into the training room. It was a brief meeting. They hired a consultant with wide shoulders. Afterward, we met for margaritas to deconstruct it. I always remember when someone mentions Van Halen, these two really drunk kids. Some of us are abandoned altogether, little cartoon gods in khaki jackets, and some of us grow out of militant excess. Sometimes I wave at the neighbors, the one who feels he needs to call me Mr. Stephen, and the one who talks about aging while working, and the one to whom Liz and I have never spoken. One of the many fantasy lights spilling an exhaust all its own. When I'm in Vegas, I stay at T.I. I hit 12 just about every time. I go to a meeting on St. Louis Avenue. Little babies in the fronds with baby hiccups, just like back when we all had a lot of money. These wise editors, Tony, Melissa, Adam. A little later, the ghostly radiator, I remember. Pebbles with lights under the water and tadpoles. Circuitous delivery systems involving left-handers. One, two, three, four, he said, and we were startled. Oh, lampshade, little code for codes to break. Did I mention dactyls and trochees, line breaks, sashura? A poet whom I admire told me I won't live forever. All these near geniuses who secretly love outlaws and their spooky little story hours diplomats and their never shabby wives, streamers for El Presidente, so many things I've wanted to say. Sleep, for instance, I brought my bedroll. I was not a wise appropriator. I blushed at all the wrong times. A fountain by my head, music of water, pure irritation. You know the answers, you really do. You know the answers, but you run. Either you or the answers are holy. I believe I know which. And I finally looked up ut operator eum from Voltaire's Candide, which means to stay busy. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Our next poet is a prolific poet. She's um, written quite a lot of works and they get accolades everywhere. It is a long list of awards and accolades, so I'm just going to do the shortened version here for her introduction. Laura Madeline Wiseman's recent books are An Apparently Impossible Adventure by Aldrich Press and Leaves of Absence, An Illustrated Guide to Common Garden Affection by Red Dash, pub published by Rudd Dashboard. Her collaborative book, Intimates and Fools, with Sally Deskins, is an honor book for the 2015 Nebraska Book Awards. She holds a doctorate from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and has re received an Academy of American Poets Award, a Mari Sandoz Prairie Schooner Award, and the Wurlitzer Foundation Fellowship. She Te teaches at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and at 24 Pearl Street, the Fine Arts Work Center's online writing program. Let's welcome Laura Madeline Wiseman.
Thank you, Erin, for having me. And thank you, all of you, for being here today. Um, I'm delighted to read with Steve again. And I'm looking forward to hearing you in person, Brad. So um, I've been following this series for quite a long time. And I've had a lot of fun watching a lot of the videos that are posted online that you guys can watch, too. So they're very cool. Um, Let's see. So some of you may know I was born in Ames, Iowa, and I grew up in Des Moines, and then I went to Iowa State for my undergrad, and I came over here for grad school. And then I stayed, because it's such a great place. Um, but for me, like, I didn't love Nebraska until I got on my bicycle, okay? So I'm gonna read a, an essay about my bicycle. Um, last fall, I went on a bike ride in, from Norfolk. It was called the Seven Cities Ride. So it's seven cities in two days, but cities in Nebraska, okay? Um, and you do 100 miles. And um, I, I wrote it after the ride, and then I sent it out, and it was um, an honorable mention in a creative nonfiction uh, contest from Pacifica Literary Review. So I will read this one. It's called Seven Cities of Good. They approach me in mass, blonde, under four feet tall, each carrying a stuffed animal bound by leash. They are so close, their shoulders almost touch. They may as well be linking arms, but they aren't. I sit on a bench in Memorial Park in Clarkson, Nebraska, in front of the memorial, a gray pyramid of rough cut stone set on a dais surrounded by trees. Hi, I say as they stare. One chews her lip, one clutches a tiger, another a lion, a third pulls her long braid. How are you? I ask, unsure how to speak to these four little girls. Before dinner in the opera house, I'd come here to snack, waiting for the local high school dance squad to shake their silver pom-poms to remixes of Jessie's Girl in the afternoon light. After the buffet of sausage subs with sauerkraut, dumplings, and strudel, I'd return to wait the music, first the pom-poms and later a polka band, much as I'd come to await any such riches. Within minutes, the girls appeared, specter-like, something akin to a vision glimmering in summer's golds. Three were six, one was four, two were twins, two pairs were sisters. For an hour, they flung their stuffies into the branches, sometimes letting the leash wrap around the barks and limb. They climbed a cannon, they drew pictures, they told me they were all Czech, though could not speak the language, and on Czech days, they danced and danced. One of their brothers arrived and one of their sisters. Twice one of their fathers stood on a, parch, on a porch calling out minutes left until dinner. The sound of his voice carrying from their lawn across the park to where I sat with four girls sitting beside me or pretending to climb trees, eating the snacks from my saddlebag or gesturing as they recounted how they decorated their bikes and made signs that said, go bikers go, to greet us, the seven city, seven city riders when we arrived in town for the night. I was one of the writers. Even if I didn't fully know why I'd signed up, why I began long distance cycling for fun, what cycling gave me beyond fitness and health. I'm searching and I found that when I bike for many miles, sometimes after hours studying the land moving around me, I arrive somewhere that is less physical and more mental, a place reachable only by bike. Now I feel their questions, as if they are oracles or fates, measuring which strings to cut and which to leave long and tensil strong. Or maybe they're Czech maidens of myth who compel some to swallow what's laced by something sleep-inducing. I am tired. I've biked 70 miles, but they're just girls in a park in Nebraska. Are you having a sleepover at the high school? One asks, one of the twins with freckles across her nose. No, I say. But my dad said you were having a sleepover at the high school. I scan the area, houses, a sweet shop with outdoor tables, old brick building businesses, the backside of the opera house, where most of my fellow riders eat, awaiting the band. I look towards the street, unsure of the high school's location, knowing only that I wasn't part of a sleepover, even if I'd been on other rides where such high schools open their doors to cyclists. When I arrived mid-afternoon to set up my tent, I'd stopped at the welcome booth beside a fire station where cheery greeters called hello and welcome, including one with a great grizzly white beard. 
Had I been elsewhere, but on a tour of seven cities in Nebraska, moving through golden light and beneath the big Midwestern skies, upon seeing this man, I might have thought Dumbledore, or perhaps a disguised king. Certainly had he stepped from a grove of trees rather than sit throne like under a bucking tent of white welcome, I would have thought wizard, God anointed prince, one of the wise. Even still, I felt something akin to otherworldliness, as if there were riches of this land that I had not yet glimpsed. Welcome to Clarkson, he said, chuckling, nodding at me, my bike, the lines of bikes behind me rolling into town. What can I help you find? A sprite of a woman with a cap of dark hair handed me a town brochure, a schedule of local events, and a map. Other cyclists asked about shower locations, pool, park, high school, and I asked where I might put up my tent, hoping for some breezy place to let its green dome sway with the wind of the plains. I scanned the sweeps of green, the flicker and catch of the light on the pool, the volleyball sand, the baseball field. I wanted to be near water, some place that bounced the music and melody of the park, the wind in the leaves, the, so the song of insects. The white beard said, set it up wherever you like. So I had, erecting the dome and unzipping the windows, letting the wind swirl over my sleeping mat. I didn't know what was to come, much as I still hardly felt like I knew where I lived. I was born and raised Midwesterner, had traveled elsewhere to no difference, and yet even if I'd lived in Nebraska for over a decade, I still felt strange by its strangeness. Tent up, I showered. I ate among un others in a room scented by sauerkraut. I sat at the park with the pyramid and spectral girls. I watched the dancers. I watched the band. I refound my tent chanting silently in my head to better remember the towns I'd visited during the day, Norfolk, Stanton, Pilger, Wisner, Howells, and the towns I'd pedal through tomorrow, Madison, Enola, Norfolk, and the town where I was to sleep, Clarkson. All day and last night, I'd feasted on food spread out, spaghetti and breadsticks, pork loin sandwiches and potato chips, orange wedges and piles of bananas, granola bars, bagels, big pots of coffee. I felt good, strong, powerful, even if the back of my thighs ached from the climbs. One cyclist had quipped, I've never seen so many 6% hills. I felt hungry, even if I was full. I was intrigued by a town where children danced and danced, of a world with so much sauerkraut, of growing up among dads who played polka. Hills make good work of the body make it warm and loose and comfortable, as if pressing and lifting pedals for hours was an accomplishment, provable in one day. I zipped up my tent, still unsure of the high school's location and the sleepover in which the girls insisted I belonged, and fell into sleep so rich and deep, one would think I wasn't lying on a mat in a tent. In the morning, as soon as I get out of town, I can't see. Fog obscures the road, the dawn, lights from cyclists ahead of me, and lights from oncoming cars. I follow the white line and watch for orange route markers, gauging distance without knowing mileage. For though I wear a GPS watch, it's not smart or expensive, lacking a real-time map of where I am against where I'm heading. The road is devoid of sound, no birds, insects, or cars. The wind roars in the silence as I pedal steadily, not knowing what's coming or what might be lingering nearby. The light is too dim for sunglasses, and when I slide on my clear lenses, they fog. I hook them into the neck of my pullover, one hoary with beaded moisture as if I were draped in spider webs, shimmering in dew. When I hit a bump, my helmet showers me. When I grip the bars, the handlebar tape is wet. When I wipe the sniffles from my nose, my nose becomes wetter, everything damp, humid, swimming in strange moisture. Later over lunch, a nearsighted cyclist mentioned he told his son to take off his glasses so at least one of them could see. Another cyclist joked, wasn't that the most beautiful country we were seeing this morning? I can't see behind, beyond the shoulder, not in front or behind. Sometime after eight o'clock, I hear the first robin crowing to the sun, a yellow dot to my right that disappears, and with it, the sound of birds. I pass three fresh roadkill coyotes, likely taken out by cars, 
and the way sound vanishes in this space. I approach an intersection and turn slowly, knowing somewhere ahead is the second sag, only when I bite to the sag sign, no tent of water and snacks emerges from the mists. I bike on, practicing not seeing, or rather trying to see with my peripheral vision, some mental exercise to see what wants to emerge and stop straining to see what isn't there, cyclists, activity, anyone else on this ride but I. I feel myself start to unhinge, some combination of miles biked and miles to go, the physical work of cycling, to visiting and being visited by strangeness in parks, to searching for something, as I've always been searching, when I move from the Sonora Desert back to the Midwest, as if the land of Seguros, though beautifully majestic, was not quite the golden splendor of fields of corn spreading across the land not the shimmering awe of the braids of the Platte River, not the wide open spaces that stretch and stretch, letting one see for miles. I was searching for what made me feel good. Biking made me feel good. I was learning this, even if right now I couldn't see 10 feet ahead of me. I'm thirsty, hungry. I stop to drink, call out, stopping to no one, slow, and then feel that shift of momentum that means I'm going down. I'm moving too fast to think. I note facts, empty road, shoulder of gravel, both clips refusing to release. The pavement comes up quick and hard and I hit it. My knee slams into the ground. My legs tangle, colliding with the frame. I'm half on the road, half on the shoulder. Without thinking, I drag my bike with me, pulling it from the road by my shoes, lest some ghostly beast emerge made of engine and gas and half blind as I. I torque hard to remove the clips. I'm okay, I say aloud to the specters, to the fates who've lifted the scissors to nick the string but not cut it, not yet. My knee bleeds, oozing over fresh road rash. Mud streaks across my knickers and grit lines the crevices of my shoes. I curse a lot. With a rock, I work debris wedged against the clips, feeling lost in the ethers. I stand and refuel to steady my nerves, that spook I feel inside this silence. I unfold the root map, as if the act of holding it will let me see. I think it's 10 more miles to the next town, Madison, but it might be more. I remount, I have no choice. Within minutes, a, sport, a support vehicle emerges from nowhere, a bike secured to its hitch. A woman leans from the window and says, the last sag didn't show. She asks if I need anything, if I'm good, and suddenly I realize beyond the road rash, I am. I'm good, I say, nodding her farewell into the mist that envelop her truck, but to a lesser degree. I listen to the music of the engine, letting it guide me down the road into a fog that lifts and lifts until it's gone. In town, I explore a museum with trains and local history, including a display on the orphan trains that arrived at last century's turn. Greeters offer free bananas, cookies, and iced tea, and I eat and drink from them, sustenance that tastes like honey, Tea has never tasted so good, not fruit, as if with the lift of the mist was the lift of some veil that had prevented me from knowing such sweetness, as if I'd failed for years to notice what goodness was right here. Thank you, I tell each of them. But that is still in the future, tomorrow. Now I'm trying to figure out where the sleepover is. If perhaps I've pitched my tent near the wrong pool of water, I glance at the girls who stand around me in the park, and though I hold the map in my pannier, I only know what I've already found. Hot showers, steaming buffets of dumplings, welcomers with hoary beards, and girls who decked out their bikes in welcome. Some of us are sleeping in the high school, I say, guessing. I'm staying at the pool. Oh, she says, flicking a yellow feather in the air and then drawing its edge across her face like a spell, like an act by a hypnotist, like a little girl. Quirky, honest in commands, wise in curiosity. She pokes the feather into her hair and pulls it out, commanding, look, I do. She asks, what's in your bag? I take the items out, ask them about school, about what they want to be when they grow up, a power ranger, a botanist. If they take dance, science, or art, what they've done this summer, what sports they play. 
Can I draw? One asks, and they take turns drawing in my notebook. A bike, a horse, sorry, a house, a mountain. I ask them to read aloud from the town's brochure. One names the people and the places pictured, though it's unclear if they're reading the text or naming the world they know. When they finish drawing, I ask them to sign their name, to write the town's name, the thing they've sketched. One of them writes, Bic, B-I-K. You need one more letter, I say, nodding towards her stick figure on wheels with a round handlebar, a person who seems to be made of a lot of dresses and lots of toes. She looks at me and then at the paper, taps the paper with the pen as if she needs a little bit more help in identifying where the missing letter might go. Bike is spelled with an E on the end, I say, and point to where it belongs. She completes the word, shows it to me, and I compliment her, and we go on like this, drawing and describing, fleeing stuffies into the trees and practicing what I call their mad climbing skills as they haul themselves up a monument, a monument of cannons. Around us burbles the talk of cyclists at tables, eating ice cream and pie, and cyclists walking in groups to wherever cyclists go post-ride to town gathering places, to tents, to laughter among folding chairs, to more good food, and then a little more. The eldest sister, a middle schooler, appears and disappears, sits among us to tease her siblings, leaves and sits again, eyeing me as if I might be more vagabond than woman, more in disguise than fellow Nebraskan, like some Odysseus cloaked and missed by a god. She rides up on a scooter as one of the twins spent dervishes under the trees holding a twig with drying leaves. Come here, she calls to her sister, pushing the scooter over to the bed of the perennials. This leaf is bigger than your head. The girl runs over and she presses her sister's head against the leaf to show her the difference in size. The girl squeals in delight, escaping from her sister's hand as the big sister trots off cat-like. I call to her as she's about to step from the sidewalk to the street, her foot hovering midair. She spin leaps towards the sound. What type of plant is it, I ask. She glances towards the leaf and then back to me, shrugging. It's a hosta. Hosta, she repeats, nodding slowly, like the young botanist she might become. Her sisters repeat the word like a chant, lingering on the rattling rumble of the word. When their dad calls them to dinner, one son says to me, I'll be back, wait right here, as two run off to eat and the other two follow for reasons unexplained. I take their departure as the sign to make my own and bike to where I will sleep, to where I will rise to cycling through mist to a, to a museum of miniature trains and a display on orphan trains. But that's tomorrow, tomorrow when I will ask the volunteer how many children were sent here. About 30, she says. And I think of the girls like creatures from another world, wondering if any of them were met with the wonder I felt in the park. I thank her again for the tea. I return to the ride, to the penultimate town of Vanola, where three boys wave as they stand in the line on the side of the road. Two of them give me high fives, while the third looks at his hand considering, measuring perhaps his, sen his sense of what bikes are, what people are on bikes, and what might happen sh should he reach out to hand in such greeting, as if to touch one of us might change him by that fleeting contact. A tailwind pushes me all the way to Norfolk and lunch, where I arrive to a chat among others. One cyclist asks what ride I hope to do next, as we sit at tables beside a lake. I don't have a ready answer, and the cyclist nods in commiseration. Now I'm just a spectator, he says. For a moment, I'm sure he said specter and glanced towards the lake where a fountain sprays water that falls in rainbow rainbows, how they dazzle in spectral delight, making the park ephemeral and beautiful. I don't know what to say. I only know that this was a good ride, a nice ride, a ride rich with cities I'm glad to know are here. So I say, I'll see you next year. All right, thank you. Thank you, Laura. I'm inspired to take up biking. <laughs> Our final uh, reader today is Bradford Tice. He's the author of two books of poetry, Rare Earth, published by New Rivers Press in 2013, which was named the winner of the 2011 Many Voices Project, and a 2014 Debulitzer finalist, and was, 
and What the Night Numbered, by Trio, published by Trio House Press in 2015. This was the winner of the 2014 Trio Award. His poetry and fiction have appeared in such periodicals as The Atlantic Monthly, North American Review, The American Scholar, Epoch, as well as in Best American Short Stories 2008. His poetry is also selected as the winner of Prairie Schooner's 2009 Edward Stanley Award. He currently teaches at Nebraska Wesleyan University here in Lincoln. Let's welcome Bradford Tice. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you all for, for uh, being here. Um, it, it's so exciting to, to read this part of this series with such uh, talented, talented uh, writers. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, the poems I'm going to read are from my most recent collection, uh, What the Night Numbered, which was uh, published by Trio House Press. And just to tell you a little bit about this collection before I uh, begin, um, I sort of described this book as a, uh, a novella in verse, if you will. Um, so the book sort of simultaneously tells two stories. It uh, retells the uh, events of... Uh, the Stonewall Riots of 1969, which, if you don't know, was a series of riots uh, which took place in Greenwich Village in New York City, uh, which were credited in a lot of ways for jumpstarting the gay and lesbian uh, civil rights movement. Um, but it also retells uh, the, the story of the Roman myth of Cupid and Psyche. Um, and the first poem I'm going to read is, uh, I, I felt like when I was uh, writing these, these poems, I needed an introduction to the Stonewall Inn, which was the, the, the gay bar uh, outside of which these, these riots took place. So I, I kind of needed um, a, a lead into that space, if you will. So uh, this poem is sort of a list poem uh, that kind of gives you a, a sort of sense of that setting, as well as some of the, the clientele uh, that inhabited that space. Uh, the speaker of this poem is uh, a young a young individual named Psyche, who I sort of imagined in this series as uh, an individual who'd come to New York having to uh, escape uh, a sort of you know, very uh, tempestuous uh, family life. And I sort of imagined her as an individual who was transgender at a time when there was not really even kind of a word for someone uh, of that identity as yet. Um, so this is Psyche uh, explaining to a young man how to gain admittance to the Stonewall. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll mention before uh, starting this poem, uh, at the time uh, that the Stonewall riots uh, took place, it was actually illegal uh, for um, a bar in New York to serve an op uh, a known uh, open homosexual, which, ma which made uh, running a gay bar very difficult. Um, so the way that a lot of these bars got around it is they were, they were mafia run. Uh, so at the door, you had to sort of, you know, uh, to sort of uh, avoid uh, police harassment or, or police raids. They would often ask you, uh, you know, to describe the interior of the bar, which meant that you could sort of, you'd been there before, you at least knew somebody who had been there. Um, but also these, these bars, uh, to get around the, the law against serving uh, you know, known homosexuals, they were often run as bottle clubs, which meant that um, there was see, so these bar, like the bottles behind the bar with like, sort of names on them. So the idea was that these were like, you know, uh, bottles that people had brought in uh, for their own personal stock, uh, and the bartenders would serve individuals from uh, their own individual bottle. But this was all kind of a, uh, a fiction at the, the Stonewall Inn. Uh, in fact, if you got in the door, they would serve you whatever you wanted. All right, so this is Psyche explains to a young man how to gain admittance to the Stonewall. First of all, honey, look the part, like you belong in a dive for queers. You know what to do, a sash of dahlia, dab of perfume. Think floral in December, a winter garden. The doorman, blonde Frankie, will ask you to describe the inside of the bar, entrapment being what it is, love. Lily Law rapping at the door like Poe's nevermore raven. Nevermore, please. Here's what you'll tell Frankie. Avoid. The walls bare, smoke drenched from the fire that nearly gutted the place. Black paint they threw up over the soot. A speakeasy without a note left in it. Tell him about the bottles that like churches behind the bar, their fronts bearing strips of paper with a name. Not a word of how Zazu named them all, giving them, giving them the monikers of Johns who had beaten her, pigs who dragged her by her hair to the back of their patrol cars, Patrick O'Reilly, Danny Boy Schmidt, Lewis Tucker. Tell him you know it's one dollar admission, three for the weekend. Tell him the bar is a grotto, just enough light to tell the mermen from flounders. Don't mention the faces you miss. Arnie, outed in the papers after a raid, found in a bathtub, wrinkled, wrists not well. Tell him you know Andy, the dancer, but not a peep about the way your fingers smell after you slip them past his gold made trunks, wrapped a dollar around the underside of his balls. Heaven, by the way. 
Tell him you know Maggie Jiggs, old personal friend whose pockets are most certainly not stuffed with dope, acid, bezpital. Tell him you know John, the bathroom attendant, who offers you soap that smells like urinal cakes, but who smiles and pretends not to see the too many pairs of shoes in each stall. Tell him you're aware the front room is for whites, the back room for blacks, Puerto Ricans. Tell him you don't intend any trouble. Tell him about the wishing well, left over from when it was a Greek restaurant, now used for storage. Leave out how you tossed in a penny, heard it clang against glass, ice buckets, whispered, wished for the hot number across the bar, a night without a raid, or at least time enough for Diana's song to finish playing. Tell him jukebox, disco ball, sizzle of sweat on the floor lights, the table on which someone carved reprint. But don't ever tell him the real reasons why you came, that your jaws ache of love, your shoulders drawn up, tired. Don't mention the blunt-eyed teenagers you passed coming in who may be doubling back, their feet kicking at the gutter for a pipe, a brick, and how you can't even be bothered. Don't ask, if not here, where. All right, so uh, this next, pe uh, this next uh, piece I'm going to read. Uh, so throughout the collection, uh, there's other poems that are uh, sort of you know, uh, feature like these two characters, uh, Cupid and Psyche. And throughout the collection, the, the sort of character of uh, Cupid sort of changes, uh, you know, his persona, like, you know, uh, from poem to poem. So I'll read a few of those. Uh, but this one is actually still narrated from uh, Psyche's point of view, but it's sort of, you know, addressed to Cupid. And I really had to give, uh, you know, s sort of props to uh, a man named David Carter, who's a historian, uh, who wrote a book, Stonewall, like, you know, the, the riots that sparked the gay revolution. Because uh, uh, in a lot of ways, it was his book that, say, that inspired a lot of these pieces. Uh, in this particular poem, uh, there's a reference to uh, that the Cupid figure in this poem uh, is actually sort of inspired by a sort of story that came from uh, his history, which was um, a, s a story about a young man uh, who, you know, uh, like a lot of these young people who uh, participated in the Stonewall riots were sort of street kids. They were living on the streets of New York. A lot of them were sort of you know, prostituting themselves to get by. Uh, there's a story about one of them who had uh, a very sort of noticeable like, you know, scar or burn mark on his cheek. Uh, and the story went that the, re uh, the way that he got that scar is that when he came out to his mother, uh, she held his like, face to the hot iron of an oven uh, in order to sort of mar his face so that no one would actually sort of you know, uh, want to, uh, to date him or, sort of, you know, or be with him. So uh, this poem is sort of partially inspired uh, by uh, that individual. So this is The Wedding Night. To some, vulgarity is a prayer we whisper to the bone of our pelvis. Mine, honey, is tired of listening. Above me, you switch off the light, as you always do, afraid of what its touch could turn you into, the reverse of some lupine curse. We meet in the dark, sheets thick as thieves. I feel you beside me, an absence overlaying omission. On your breath, the dark reek of Chianti you slip past the bellboy. Your tongue is a wetted cork against my neck. In the moments before light left us, you were talking about your mother. How did you describe her? A manacled tiger with a, paper, with a paper doll in its jaws? A house cat eating its kittens under rosewood cabinets? In the gloom, I trace what you won't let me touch in the light, and your face under my fingers resembles the scene of a Japanese screen. Tight fabric, and under this, fog, stunted pines, crags, herons, fish scaled with jewelry, and under this, a woman naked, her garments strewn, massaging the muscles of her leg. Your scar, run the length of the right side of your face, is the texture of asphalt on a summer day, bubbling tar at the moment it becomes malleable. That first night you took me from the pier, brought me to this blue hotel with its lampshades and scent of smoke and tallow. You wouldn't turn your cheek to me. When I asked, you said it was a gift from your mother, who was afraid men would be turned by the Osage dusk of your beauty, so it held your face to the flames herself. I let you enter me, and what you do know is the rhythm of my body under yours, the hum that swells in the back of my throat like a bee between the palms of a boy. What you don't know is that after we were, uh, you were asleep, I struck, a flint of, uh, sorry, I struck the flint of a lighter and held it over your face until I had memorized every trial of its topography, until I was sure I knew you, until the heat of the flint could be suffered no longer, and I dropped the flame onto your chest. You woke with a start, hurling yourself out of the bed, sweat slicking your body, a tiny cherry between your breasts. From this I learned two things, that there is a part of you that will always be leaving me, 
and there is nothing. Maelstroms, moonlight, the singeing mouth. I will not dare to keep you. Uh, so this next poem is, is also like a, uh, uh, one of the sort of Cupid poems, and uh, this one is actually narrated from the uh, the voice of Cupid. Um, it's actually one of the, the only poem that sort of takes uh, place outside of New York City. Um, I, in uh, David Carter's book, there's a reference to a place that, uh, that was uh, referred to as a Tascadera State. It was a, a mental hospital, and a lot of uh, individuals who were committed, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, committed to like, insane asylums for being homosexual, such as you know, by, uh, by the courts or by their families, were often uh, sent to this place. And it was uh, often referred to as the Dachau for, uh, for queers, uh, since a lot of individuals who entered this space never got out. All right, so uh, this poem is entitled Cupid at the Asylum. I had wounds sutured up the slope of my arms, and they were like railroads, the hatch marks you find on maps that lead to something. Upon being committed to Tascadero State, the Dachau for queers, I was an aberrant mark in the, in the margins of the judge's book, a spider's fee spinning on a single strand of, of web. Outside, there are trees with oranges as big as human hearts, and I don't think it's too much to ask that God show a little mercy. What got me here was an Italian dishwasher, the tattoos on his arms faded, indecipherable stains, the wounds I got from a plate glass window running from the cops. Folks glimpse stitches, uh, they think it's suicide, a cry for help. I've lived long enough to know there's no one listening. Why waste the breath? What I remember is spotty, the electroshock making my day slippery as eels. The orderly makes buzzing noises whenever he turns off the lights. I try to ignore him, but he knows I can feel current in my bones. When I shut my eyes, I see my mother, years ago in a blue dress, bright clusters of cherries gathered at the collar, her hand gripping mine. We're waiting for something, a train, the songs in temple, my father to return from business. It's been 14 years and we're still waiting. The words the doctors are using now, I can barely understand. Lobotomy, castration, sexual deviance. The words are a part of a thing that's inside me, they say, a thing that will need to be lanced. When the judge handed down the sentence, 10 years in a Tascadero, I heard my mother cry out, the dull thud of her body hitting the floor. My mother did not come out of Dachau. She came out of Auschwitz. Though she never spoke of it, except to say when I was cruel and would not eat, how in the camps she'd consumed grass, said it was like eating your own grave. I didn't know what she meant until the night in the park when they caught us, the dishwasher at my back and the scent of grass strong in my nostrils, and then shouts, the lights, and the knowing. The pills they give us here make me feel like I'm buried up to my nose in the earth's thickness. There's no coming back from a place like this and I can't help but notice that my stitches pass over the very space where the faded ink of my mother's numbers uh, ascend her arm. How my wound on hers would obscure the other. This of, course has no moon as, this, of course, has no meaning. Crazy talk. The orderly who brings creamed corn and jello, his teeth the same gray color as the steak, asks what I intend to do with my testicles once the doctors take them. I tell him, send them to my mother. Not to be cruel, you understand, or snide, or even indelicate. But because of all the people in this world, she's the only one who would know how to take madness and keep it. She's the only one who would know what to do with such things. All right, so I'm going to, leave, I'm going to uh, finish with uh, two pieces. Um, and these pieces you know, take place in the last section of the book uh, when the, sort of the riots are in full swing. Um, so I, I got to the end of this collection, and you know, I, I kept thinking, you know, since I'm sort of going off of, uh, of myth, uh, and the, you know, the myth of Cupid and Psyche is very much uh, a story about you know, these two lovers coming together, and of course there's a marriage at the end, as, as Cupid, this, this rapscallion god, is sort of brought back to the social order uh, through marriage. Um, so I kept thinking, like, you know, as I was getting to the end of this collection, that there would be some sort of marriage between these two characters of uh, Psyche and Cupid uh, that I've been working with. Um, but I, I just couldn't write the poems, and I think and eventually I sort of figured out that Psyche didn't really want to be married to, 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 <laughs> to Cupid. She didn't think he was quite worth it yet. Um, so I, I wrote these two pieces, and, and they're sort of like, you know, companion pieces. Uh, the first is from the point of view of Cupid uh, speaking to, uh, to Psyche, and then the, uh, the second piece is, is Psyche's response back to him. Uh, and you'll, you'll get a sense of, like, you know, where their relationship sort of ended up. So the first one is entitled, Cupid Waits from a Bender to Witness Psyche at the End of Her Trials. When I woke... The night was long birthed and walking the streets. 
and the first thing I perceived was my foot in the piss trail of light from the lamps on Christopher, my back friendly with the brick face of a wall. What I heard then was new and alien, not the sirens, those old divas wailing, not the alley's cat calls, the ping of a bottle dropped, the shouts, the curses, which was nothing unique. It was the awe between these sounds, like the breathing of someone hidden who wants to be found. I stood then, stepped into the street. No one noticed. I stood there, the crowd swelling in front of the stone wall like a struck eye, the night going purple to old yellow in the margins of the street lamps. I remember thinking, someone must be dead. Another of us found snuffed, the song captured in some boy's throat as it, tries to, as it tried to rise. Then I saw you, heels in your hands and an arrow in your side like a Saint Sebastian tied at his stake. Or at least the spirit of the icon was there, a kind of swooning in the face of so much rising. Everything goes tipsy after this, and riots make their own time. Afterwards, only slices you remember, a boy with blood on his neck, shirt bald and pressed to his lip. The weight of someone's body you caught as they tripped. There's no way to own a thing like that, even though I knew I would spend the rest of the long ages claiming that I touched you, and that this was more than something I had failed. Years later, I'll say that I fought by your side, your hand gripped in mine, even though it was someone else's you held. My beautiful brawler, I saw when you fell. You and the other girls who rolled up your pants into knickers formed a kick line. When the police charged, you turned a step too late and I watched you hit your knees from the force of the blow to your back. Lifetimes from now, I want to name myself your savior. But it was one of your kind, a street kid, who took your hand and pulled you back into their number. Me, I was the one who watched all of your trials, suffering in the face of my desire for the grit of your jaw, brace of your back, did nothing but wait for the story to finish. <laughs> and here's the next piece, Shrine of Human Faces. At first, I imagined you searching as I was searching, imagined as passing in the crossing of two streets, your shoulder brushing mine, me looking off into the high branches of the park towards some future that I imagined had us pinned to a tableau of stars. Whoever said those suns were anything more than beautiful burning rubbish? All right, thank you all. Thank you, Brad, and all of you. Uh, if you guys enjoyed these poems and would like to read more from their books of poetry, uh, the Lincoln City <laughs> Library's collection has poem, uh, these poetry books available for checkout. And then on the back table behind us, we have some of uh, the books laid out. Those are the Heritage Room collection books, so you may look at them, but they have to stay in the collection. But they are back there if you want to look at them. Also, Laura Madeline Wiseman has some books available. Um, she's donating 100% of profits uh, if anyone wants to buy a book to the Heritage Room Endowment. So uh, you might consider that as well and Laura can tell you more about that. Uh, we do have a small gift for each of you from the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. It's um, just a book of blank paper and uh, some magnetic poetry by Willa Cather. Just in case inspiration strikes you'll have a place to uh, uh, to record that. So um, I'll give those to you in just a moment. And if, um, if anyone is available after the program, Constellation Studios uh, which did the artwork, Karen Kuntz, um, and Karen Kuntz is a wonderful Nebraska author sh or artist. She is um, receiving the 2016 Mayor Arts, Mayor's Arts Award for visual artist this year. So uh, she's a relevant and incredible artist here in Lincoln. And she uh, is hosting a reception following, immediately following at 3.30 um, for the poets and for all of you. So if you'd like to interact and um, speak with the poets today, we can meet at Constellation Studios. You'll know it right away. It's about six blocks away on O Street, about the corner of 20th and O. Is that right? 20th and O. Um, it has the big, beautiful mural. You can't miss it. So um, that is immediately after that. And also, I just wanted to make you aware of a couple events coming up through uh, Lincoln City Libraries and NLHA. We have, um, as well as the Ames Reading Series, we host a uh, Lunch at the Library series, and we have um, two, two left this season. We have Phyllis Moore coming in April. It's always the first Wednesday of the month at noon, and that's in the fourth floor auditorium. So Phyllis Moore is going to be here in April, 
And then we'll have Aubrey Strike Krug um, speaking about John Nyhart in May. And so um, you're, we'd love for you to attend any of those as well. And also we have our spelling bee, our annual adult spelling bee, which is the big NLHA fundraiser. And that is the Tuesday after Easter. And there's literature and all of those things in the on the back table back here. So um, I hope you'll pick up some literature and maybe we'll see you at one of those. So thank you all for coming and um, please join us at Constellation Studios. Thank you. Thank you.